Welcome, 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 everyone. What is going on? All right. I got little people here today, y'all. So we going to hope that these little people behave. I threatened them. I'm just playing. What is up, y'all? Welcome to my High Performance at High Noon call. I am Jice Johnson, Work-Life Integration Strategist, and I want to thank you for joining me today on this last call for the year. So super excited to have you, and I actually just want to start off by saying thank you because this call started in October, um, so I just want to thank you to everyone that has rocked with me um, for the fourth quarter with this. And um, this is the last call for 2022, um, but we're going to resume on January 4th because this call is every Wednesday at noon Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So I am super excited um, and just really honored and blessed for the um, opportunity to engage in like really great conversation and also to share some of my experience with how I've gotten where I've gotten and how I'm going to keep getting where I'm going. Um, I want to invite you to join me in Miami in February. So February 18th, we have um, the Mimosas and Manifestation. This is our second branch that we'll be hosting in Miami. So you know, I don't feel like we need a whole lot of excuses to go to Miami, but if you need an excuse to go to Miami, then this can be that excuse for you. Um, so join me out there. That is February the 18th. And um, and then we'll get started. Um, I started this call because actually I started this call because I had a lot of trials that I have lived through, like like most of us. And I started this call because I have seen some success. Um, and I've started this call because I've had the wonderful opportunity and experience to see and feel what it is to live life on purpose. And I often get asked, how do you do it? And I say with a lot of grace and with work-life integration. So today I'm going to be talking about the cost of success because there is a cost to success, but the way that we live often speaks volumes about what we value and how we see ourselves. And when I have that recognition, like when it dawned on me that the way that I live, what is showing up on the outside, not that you can't be going through a trial, not that you can't be going through a situation, but ultimately the way that I live, the way that I show up, um, that is a that is a direct reflection of like what I value and what I see in myself for myself, how I see myself. And so, um, you know, it, it is, it's reflected in what you accept in your life. It's reflected in who you're around. It's what it's reflected in what you take in. Um, I just had a whole, like, I haven't, I, I've revealed that I've had some health issues, but I haven't really revealed like to the extent of what those health issues look like. But some of these are self-inflicted wounds because it's about what I've allowed to take in to my body, right? Like the types of foods that I've eaten. Um, it's, you know, it, it's reflected in what you take into your mind, what you take into your spirit, what you take into your space. Um, and it all costs something. And so it, it, it all costs something. For most of us, it costs us our lives. For most of us, it costs us our lives. And I think that piece is like one of the most important things that I really came to understand in this space is that what's happening on the outside, what we are putting around us, doing who we're around, what we're eating, what we're watching, what we're taking in, it costs us our life. Like it literally costs us our life. It costs us the way that we want to live. 
and how we tell ourselves, because oftentimes we don't believe that the way that we want to live is feasible. So we just accept what it is that we put ourselves around. And because we lie to ourselves, we often don't take ourselves seriously. So um, when I was growing up in Oakland, I had like my first real mentor that I have like strong recollection of, right? My first real mentor, um, Sergeant Major and Junior ROTC. Um, and I need to go look up his name because I really don't know his name. I just like, we only could call him Sergeant Major. So in my mind, he's just Sergeant Major. Um, but anyway, Sergeant Major. So I was growing up, I had a lot of opportunities for leadership. Like I had opportunities to lead at church. I was very active. My mom is like, I call my mom Jesus' best friend. So my mom was like super active in church. Therefore, I was super active in church, um, very active in school. I'd always been active in school and things of that sort. But it wasn't until my first mentor, Sergeant Major, he in junior ROTC program, he really um, spoke to me in my 10th grade year. And he was like, you have a quality about you, but you show up as a joke. And like, I don't know if those words, like they impacted me at that time because I made adjustments. But I would say that as I have repeated that to myself a few times in the course of my life, it's impacted me in major ways. Like you have all this potential, but you're showing up as a joke. And he said, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost for you to be a joker or it's going to cost for you to be a leader. What, what are you going to pay for? But in all cases, understand that you're paying for something, right? You're paying with your time. You're paying with your energy. You're paying with your experiences. You're paying with pain. And oftentimes we don't even make our pain count for nothing. We don't even make our pain count. I think that right there is such an important factor of we all experience pain, but how do some of us turn our pain into a pathway or a purpose or a thing that helps us grow to our next level? And how many of us just sit in our pain and we don't even let our pain pay for the next level, the pay for the next thing, right? We pay with money. We pay with our peace. We pay with our sleep. Like we pay to live a mediocre life or we pay to live a life that's on purpose and a life we love. In all cases, we're paying, but there is a cost for success and it does cost a little bit more. It costs a little bit more because you have to be more intentional. You can't just blow whichever way the wind takes you. You can't just have whatever's coming. You can't just do whatever everybody else is doing. When you are thinking about the version of you that needs to be most successful, it costs you because you have to put, you have to make that investment. So one way you're just paying and there's no return on investment. The other way you're paying, but you get a return on that, on that investment. So which way do you want to go? So if you're here, I assume it's, it's, it is success, right? But I want to be able to highlight that because so often what I see is that People are not willing to make investments in themselves. They want to see success, but they're not really willing to make investments in themselves. And part of it is because they don't even understand that no matter what you are paying with something, it's what are you getting for what you're paying? What is the outcome? What is the return on that investment? So there are three areas that I think we don't spend enough on. And these, I'm sorry, three, I have four areas. I can't count. I have four areas that we don't spend enough on, and I want to talk about those four areas. Hold on for one moment, please. All right, so I have these four areas that we don't spend enough. Okay, so the first area is planning and preparation. Now, you got some folks that just jump out there and do something they ain't plan nothing. They just get out there and do it. And I applaud those people because you be trying to fly the plane and build it. I've been that. Um, and there is some level of success that you will see with that, right? But we want to talk about what's the, what gives you the best opportunity to really see success and where do you see the most return on your investment? So the first place is you have to plan and prepare. And what I suggest, because I hear people do things like, and I've been guilty of this. So this is, this is the space in which I have evolved and grown to thinking about planning in this way, in sprints, in phases, and in ramp ups. Because when we get out here and we about to plan the whole year, like what did you plan in January that that like really was consistent, bowed out, went the way you expected it to all the way in December now? Most of the time, 
that's next to nothing. Like it, you just, you can't determine what's getting ready to happen in so many areas, right? How many people started 2020 with the plan? Y'all remember 2020 was the year of vision. This was about to be phenomenal. And then COVID. I mean, sometimes you just can't plan, right? So you have to be able to like pivot. So you can't plan so far in advance. So you can have a far off outlook. Like I know where I want to be in 10 years, but then I have to walk that plan back, not to where I want to be in 10 years, but where I'm going to be in five, where I'm going to be in one, where I'm going to be in the next three months, where am I going to be in the next 30 days? And then boom, 30 days. What's getting ready to happen in 30 days, 90 days? How do I create these sprints and phases? And so you have to have that broader version or that broader picture, but you've got to know that there's so there's an unlimited amount of things that could take place over the next 10 years that there's no real way to plan out how that's going to go. You plan the direction, you plan how what you're trying to achieve, and then you've got to be able to break it down into a 30 day, a 60 day, a 90 day sprint. A one year sprint is too long. Now you can develop a habit that you want to develop over the next year, but you're still going to check in with yourself early enough to make tweaks and adjustments. So I'll get there. But one, we do not spend enough time planning and preparing for in sprints, in phases or in ramp ups, like in a way where you can say, okay, phase one in first 90 days, I'm going to do like this. Here's the targets that I'm going to hit. Here's the goals that I'm trying to make. Here's what I want to see. And some of that is because we're in this microwave type of society. Like I'm, one of my coaching programs that I'm in, we talk about this all the time where people will put up a thing, right? And so in this case, it's like a sales funnel. They're going to put this sales funnel up. They're going to put this thing up. And then in in 10 days, if they don't see it working, as far as they're concerned, it don't work. When that's just not how it works, right? Like you have to plan out things in phases and sprints and in ramp ups. And so when you are able to do that, that allows for you to one, be clear about how you're going to execute. So that's step two. So one is planning and preparation and sprints, phases, and ramp ups. Then you move that into execution because when you execute, like how many of you have ever tried to plan, I mean, you know, do change everything at once. I'm about to start my morning routine, start my workout, have a new diet. I'm about to change my sleep schedule. I'm about to launch this new business. You try to do all the things at once. So then you can't really execute on anything at once. So that's why I'm saying in sprints, in phases, in ramp ups, where you can start to develop certain things. I'm going to do 30 days of my morning routine. After 30 days of my morning routine, I'm going to add in the next 30 days. I'm going to make sure that I'm doing my workout. So now you're getting consistent in your morning routine. Now you've added your workout in after my, you know, in 90 days, you'll start to see real change if you can do it in sprints, phases, and ramp ups, but then you actually have to do it. It's the execution. So you got some folks who plan and never execute. Then you got some folks who execute with no plan. Really the place that you see the most success is when you can do both plan and then actually execute on that plan. So if your plan is so extensive, so much too heavy, too hard of a burden or too heavy of a burden to lift, you don't see success. So again, you got to break down what you're planning, break it down into phases that you can actually begin to implement and execute on. You can't take all the classes at once. If you think about a degree program, right? Like you got a semester, a semester has this many classes. You're going to take the next and this many classes. You got prerequisites. You got things you got to take this step before you can take this step. It's built out like that in order for you to get to the goal of the degree because you can't take all of it at once and become an expert overnight. You can't take your whole life and just flip it around and it's never the same. One decision at a time, one thing that we're executing at a time, you got to be able to move those things forward. And the places that we get stuck on in the execution phase is perfectionism. So it ain't how I want it to look. That's fine. Call this phase one. Call this the pilot phase. When you change how you think about it, it allows you to execute. Oh, this ain't how you want it. That's okay. We're in phase one. Phase one, we're going to hold this for 90 days. And in phase two, we're going to make some new adjustments, right? But perfectionism will stop you. Fear will stop you. 
and discipline will stop you. Those things stop you from being able to execute. That's how you execute with inconsistency. That's how you have then talked yourself out of executing at all. Or that's how you, you know, don't execute because it's not the way that you want it. So you keep on pushing back a launch, pushing back a thing, pushing back the next stage, the next space. Oh, I'm not going to work out because I don't have a gym exercise. I don't have a gym equipment, but you can go on YouTube look up a workout and do that workout every day for the first 30 days until you can go get your gym membership. You can cr create phases, create stages, create ramp ups, and then execute. Then the third thing is you want to have networks, the right networks. So that means who can help you. There's a book that I highly recommend. I feel like we talked about it before earlier in the year, but I don't remember what we were talking about, but it applies. The book is called Who, Not How. My coach recommended this, it to me. I'm recommending it to you. Who, Not How. It is, the concept of this is that you are not the one to do all the things in order for you to create a successful life. Who is the one who's going to do that thing? And that who can be as big as a, a person that you need to hire to bring in. That who can be Who's about to clean up your house every day so that, I mean, every week so or day, however you clean your house, so you can gain back two to three hours of your time? Who, not how? Your network is wildly important in that space. One of the things that I see that we do is we have poor relationship management. So we have some people who are very well networked. They know a lot of people, but they have not managed those relationships well at all. So that means you may have to go back and do some credibility damage. Like if you have not followed through on what you said you were going to do, you are inconsistent in how you show up, you might have to go back and start setting some uh, some new expectations, right? I'll give you one ex personal example for me. If you have known me over the last several years, I show up late everywhere, okay? I'm late everywhere. I'm late everywhere. So I don't know how many relationships this is damaged. Like people who know me, you know, they rock with me because when I show up, I'll be ready to roll, but I show up late everywhere. So I had to make it a point this year to really work to be on time. If you have ever tried to log into this car early, it does not start until 12 p.m. on the dot. At 12 p.m., I start letting everybody, I mean, yeah, 12 p.m., I start letting everybody in. So that has been the space in which I have at times managed relationships poorly because literally people have expected me to just show up late. Like it's going to start at this time. Jice ain't going to get there for another 20 minutes. That was not okay to me. Like people who I respected were like, well, we knew you weren't going to get here on time. So I had to make a change. I had to shift that for myself. So like I have had to really focus in on the amount of preparation that I have on the front end so that I can fix those relationships because that's a space for me I have to fix now because I've gone so long without being on time. Poor relationship management. Then you got some folks that ain't got no relationships at all. I had a um, friend that I was, I wasn't really coaching them, but then it turned into a coaching session like impromptu because I was listening and I was like, mm -mm. and this is like, you know, I blame Drake, right? No new friends. No, we need to make new friends. It's absolutely okay to make new friends. So how do we go about building the types of relationships that are going to be helpful to us? So this is a space because as you're thinking about how you're going to plan and how you're going to execute, it ain't just going to be you. So I'm even at the simplest form of like going to the gym. If you ain't never been to the gym, like I was in the military. I don't feel like I have to have a trainer. I have a whole long list of military exercises I could practice over and over and over forever. If you've never been to the gym, if the gym has never been your jam, if you've never played professional sports, you've never done weightlifting, things like that, maybe the network that you need to build is somebody in that space, in the health and wellness space that can help you. So it don't have to be like a big who, you just need to be able to think about who can help you get to the next space in your goal, right? But the last thing in the relationship space is the wrong relationships. And this gets to be the hardest because oftentimes we really struggle to let go of the people in our lives that are not going to help us get to the next place, or more importantly, that are going to pull us back from where we're trying to be. Those are the ones who knows where all of the skeletons are at, but they don't really support you because every time you're about to do something, they finna tell you about one of them skeletons in your closet. They don't believe you could do it. They don't have trust and faith. Sometimes they can love you to life, but they are not the ones that are going to help you get to the next level. They don't believe in you. They don't think that you are deserving of that thing. They don't think you have the skill or the ability. You got to love them people from a distance. And so inside of our networks, we have poor relationship management. We, we're not building any new relationships or we have the wrong relationships.
So those are, that's another area that you have to actually spend some time digging into and figuring out where you sit in that space. And then the last one is adjustments and realignments. Like we don't spend any time actually course correcting. So once again, how many of you have ever created a plan? Like, okay, boom, I got it. This is what I'm finna do. And then something don't go right and you've just abandoned ship instead of adjusted your sail. Ooh, y'all don't steal that. That was mine. I'm about to post that. You have abandoned ship instead of adjusting your sail right? Like you don't finish with your plan. You don't keep your plan moving. Instead, you just drop it because now whatever it is that you planned, it didn't go the way that you wanted it to go. Now you've moved on. Now you need a new plan or now you're operating with no plan. Now you're just out here flying blindly. When, when we get onto an airplane, our pilots are consistently making small adjustments because one degree off can land you in a whole nother place. When you're, when you, you know, uh, 10 times that over, uh, over a long distance, right? So when you start your plan, you've got to be able to actually go back and assess the plan and then make the adjustment. This is an area that we don't spend time in. We do not invest in readjusting the plan and getting it back on track. It's going to get off track. There are too many variables for you to figure out. There are too many variables of things that can happen that are outside of your control. So how do you make it a process and a, and a consistent space in which you invest some time to assess what has happened and then to make the readjustments and the realignments to keep yourself on track? So these are the four areas that we need to spend more time investing in in order to be successful. We have to invest in the planning and preparation. We have to invest in the actual execution. We have to invest in the networks that we need in order for us to be successful. And we have to invest the time that it takes to assess how we have done and then make adjustments for how we move forward so that the plan can stay on track. So I hope that this is helpful as you're thinking about your plans going into 2023. I hope that this is helpful as you're thinking about how you are going to meet your goals as you have laid out whatever it is that you're planning on doing for the next year, as you start to break that down into a quarter or break that down into a month and think about what you have to do and who you need to know. It don't have to be somebody in your network. I need to know somebody who does this. I need to know somebody who does this. It don't have to be somebody that you already know. So then that becomes a part of your plan is how do you go about finding and building the right relationships with somebody who can help you be in that next space. But one of the most important places is to come back and reassess and adjust. Because if you don't do that, you will abandon ship. You can go back and look year over year over year at your goals as to how you've moved forward. And you may have made some headway, but what you know is that you plan for this and then it didn't happen. If I talked to one, if y'all were on the call last week, there was a guy who was like, I don't believe in New Year's resolutions, right? It's really not about making the resolution. The issue is, is that people make a resolve to do something. They haven't made the decision that that's what they're really going to do. And if they did make the decision that that's what they were going to do, they haven't made the, they haven't made a plan to execute on it. They haven't executed on it. They don't know who's going to help them do it. And they haven't readjusted so by the time they get back to where it is that they need to be, they have abandoned their whole resolution. So after you've done that enough times, you don't even believe you. That's why you won't set a resolution. You don't believe in yourself that you're going to hit your goals. So there, then you don't make them. So when we talk about that space of like trust, you don't trust yourself that you're going to make a goal and actually follow through on it. Because I can make resolutions all, I can make resolutions. I, I have failed at resolutions, but I can make them. I can make resolutions because I know that I can trust myself to plan and to execute and that I know how to network and I know how to readjust. If you don't have that, you're going to be really struggling. If you don't have that, you're going to be struggling. So when he said that, I tapped him. I was like, this is the problem. The problem is you don't trust yourself. That's why you don't make resolutions. So we had a whole bunch of new folks that just joined us. 
and I'm like kind of wrapping up to the tail end, getting ready to open up for questions. So I'm going to do a quick recap at the expense of everyone who is here. So my apologies, y'all, but I want to do a quick recap and then I'm going to open it up for some Q&A. So what we just briefly, what we talked about today was the cost for success. Um, and understanding that you are paying whether you are successful or you're not successful. You're paying in your time and your energy. You're paying in your pain. You're paying with your money. You're paying something. The, the real question is, are you getting a return on that car? Are you just blowing it or are you getting a return on that investment, right? Because it costs something to be unsuccessful and it costs something to be successful. When you think when we're talking about what it costs to be successful, I gave us four areas, right? This is where you need to spend in order to receive an investment, a return on your investment, where you need to spend. You need to spend time in planning and preparation. And my suggestion is that you do that in sprints, phases, and ramp ups. So um, we're not going to plan for the whole year. You plan in short bursts, right? That are going to lead up to what your goals are for the year, five years, 10 years down the line. You're going to execute. You have to execute. You have to put time and effort into that execution. So you can plan all day long. If you don't pull the trigger, ain't nothing happening. Then you need to be able to plan, I mean, invest inside your networks. And I talked about having poor relationship management, no relationships, like you ain't out there building no new relationships. You don't want no new friends. That's the wrong answer. You got to invest in that space or you have the wrong relationships, relationships that are not actually helping you get to your next level. And then the last one was you have to invest in adjusting and realigning. And so um, the example I use is with a pilot, right? Like a pilot is making constant tweaks because being just a little off can put you way off down the line. So how do you shift and readjust? So how do you make that plan, execute on that plan, and then come back and start readjusting in order to keep yourself on track? Those are four areas that you need to really put investment in so you can see a return on that investment and see some, some success. So I'm going to open it up for some Q&A um, and drop, oh, let me drop your homework on you and then I'll open it up for some Q&A. So your homework is I want you for to plan out just your next 30 days. Now, you may already have some of this because we're at the end of the year. So you may have already been thinking about your goals and what you're trying to do for Q1 or what you're trying to do for the next year or whatever. And I want you to hold to that. I'm not telling you to change that, but I want you to plan for 30 days, right? Because I just said you need to plan in sprints, right? You need to plan in ramp ups. You need to plan in phases. What's going to happen for the singular month of January? What are you going to do for January? Plan it. How are you going to execute on it? Who are the people that you need to have in that space? And I want you to actually, here's a tactical thing outside of your journaling and planning. I want you to set a calendar date for when, for each week. So for four weeks where you were going to come back and review the week and make adjustments for the following week. Probably on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday is my suggestion. That's just my suggestion. But I want you to set a calendar um, a calendar, a space in your calendar, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever feels good to you, where you're going to look over the previous week, over the, that week, and you're going to actually assess how you did and then make the adjustment for the upcoming week so that you can see where you land in 30 days. That's your homework assignment. Okay. So I'm going to open up for some, for some Q and A. What questions do you have? What, what thoughts do you have about what we talked about? I don't have any questions, but definitely thoughts. So my my definite like non, um, well, the, where there's two different things. So one of them is networks, networking. I definitely don't believe in the whole no new friends thing. But what I realized is that I don't necessarily, I mean, leverage, you know, my relationships in the way that I could or should. And, mm -hmm. and part of it was just realizing this. And I was talking uh, to, I think I was talking to Bonnie yesterday about, um, you know, even within my role within the city, like there's a lot of things that I could do. I did talk to the city attorney yesterday mm -hmm. just to try to see like, okay, what are, what are the limits to the things that I can do with what it is that I do for the city and still be able to capitalize on it? And so I yeah. think that was kind of the first step in kind of really thinking about the people that I do have contacts and connections with and, and how, you know, we could work 
together towards getting things done. And I think part of it is just my mindset on relationships and um, not wanting to use people, right? So I think that's kind of a barrier. It's, it's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want people to feel as though it's things about um, like that it's, it's a, like a give take thing, but technically that's what a relationship is and kind of like being okay with that. And then um, I definitely don't adjust often or even revisit my goals. So one of the things that I, um, that someone was saying to do was to kind of look at my goals, you know, one to two times a day, which would be helpful because I tend to kind of go and then kind of forget. And so even the weekly thing and setting that time to just go back and revisit them is definitely helpful. So appreciate it. Of course. So I want to touch on something you said about the relationships. That's super important. Like relationships ideally are not transactional, but you should be able to identify inside of your network. What are transactional relationships? Like it is okay to have transactional relationships. You don't have to have like some deep, meaningful relationship with everybody. Right. Especially because in the world of business or even inside of your career, um, like you're going to need to be able to make transactions with people. You're going to have to have some idea about who they are, what they could do, especially in positions that tend to change or adjust. Like somebody is in this position, but that person could leave and go, but that position is an important position for your business or for your um, career, right? So like whoever is the next person in that role, you still need to develop that relationship with. I'll tell you like at a high level for the work that um, my organization the Black Business Initiative does, for example, the mayor is a transitional position. The mayor that's here in Denver, he held three terms, but he will not be the mayor uh, in 2020, at the end of 2024, 2023, rather. He will not be the mayor, right? This is his last term. So as I'm looking at who the new candidates are, it's not that I don't care about the relationship with this mayor. It's just that the position of the mayor is important to this business. So it doesn't matter who the mayor is, I'm going to need to know that person and I'm going to need to build a relationship with that person in order to keep moving for my agenda. That is a transactional relationship. It would help if whoever the new mayor is, I get to know them, like them, trust them, whatever the case is. But even if I don't, I still need to build a relationship with them because it's pertinent to this, this work. So you can build like transactional relationships. And then you can also build like other relationships that help you really, that support your personal and professional development and growth and like where you need to be and how you need to, to, you know, who you need to know in order to reach your goals. So be okay with those transactions because it's really not necessarily about you using someone, but in that space, also think about how you create win-wins. So even in the trans transactional space, let's say with the mayor's office, um, the mayor has an agenda. That agenda includes equity. I have a business that helps that mayor, uh, um, you know, reach their equity goals. So it's a win-win situation. It's transactional. I need this from you. You need this from me. And we exchange these things and then we boom, we move forward, right? So he reaches his goals. I reach my goals and everybody is happy. So when you're thinking about that, it's not about you using someone and it's not even that they may necessarily have a need to, for you in that moment, but it is a space where you think about a win-win transaction. This benefits you, this benefits me, this is how we enter into this space, especially if it is transactional. So hopefully that's like helpful in thinking about how you go about relationship building, because if you can make that mental adjustment, I think that you'll be able to breeze through, um, you know, building the types of relationships that you need in order for you to stay on track. Probably, yeah. yeah, definitely helpful because the, actually the relationships I'm speaking of are very much political in nature with what it is that I do. Um, and, and that's actually, that's, exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. So when it comes to dealing with the different council members, you know, the mayor and even like our reps and things of that nature, like, um, yeah. So, I mean, and I think it is fairly like a mutual thing, but it's like, I, I don't necessarily ask for anything, but then I don't necessarily have anything to ask for either, but I am coming into the, the thought and space of thinking, especially what it is with what we're doing uh, real estate wise like how we can start to kind of leverage those relationships. So definitely yeah. appreciate it. Of course. Who else? I've got one. 
Yeah. Um, sure. You talked about resetting relationships. Sometimes we drop the ball. And one of the things I really appreciate about you is like your level of transparency and authenticity. Authenticity um, is that has that been your approach when you've had to reset to just kind of like just say from a real perspective, like I was late, but this is what I'm doing to um, hold myself more accountable to be on time. Or how do you go about resetting those expectations? Is it a verbal or is it a action thing, a blend of the both? What, what have you found successful? Yeah, I think it's a blend of the both. Like you absolutely can't verbally tell somebody something and then not follow through, right? Um, Even if it's a work in progress, like I've been working on not being late for a while, but when I wasn't holding that to account, like when I wasn't even being accountable in that space strong enough, right? I had to like double down again. Hey guys, I'm human. This has been a struggle for me. Here's where I'm at. Um, and, you know, kind of starting with my more like immediate stakeholders, right. And then really like growing and developing that and acknowledging it. Like I will talk to someone that may be, um, a very valuable network to me and say, Hey, um, you know, I'm going to be there at so-and-so time and then tell them, you know, I know in the past I've been late. I just want you to know that I'm going to be really intentional to be on time. So I'm telling you this time, and this is the time that I need, um, because they've made an adjustment, right. In the way that they may see me. But even when you take that outside of the context of time, I mean, any time that you have not held, that you have not been accountable or has shown up the way that you want to show up, because sometimes it's not even about accountability. Like you can just grow and decide this is a new way that I want to show up or a new way that I want to present. And then you do that both in what you say and in what you do. Another space that I'll give you for that, for me, for example, is the way in which I actually dress. So I used to dress, like I used to actually put a lot of effort into my, into how I dress. And then I had kids, I was really struggling. I was going through a lot of depression. I had like really overloaded my plate. I had gained a lot of weight. Next thing you know, I was in jeans and t-shirt or, um, or, uh, what do they call leggings? Like every day, all the time. And, and I made excuses for it. Like I made bold, strong excuses for it. I'll never forget. I had won this award. Um, I had won, uh, yeah, I won this award and I came up on stage and I'm in jeans. It actually funny enough. I was in, I was in this shirt, um, this blouse, it's a blouse, right? But I was in like these jeans. I had these tennis shoes on. I had this blouse and I felt like I was doing kind of all right because I put this blouse on, but I had not like spent time in like actually putting myself together. And then I get up on stage and a woman makes a comment about, did I, did you know you were getting an award today? Right. And she was a- a- assessing how I was dressed. I was so offended. Like I didn't, I didn't say nothing to her crazy because she was an elder, but I will tell you, I literally like for days, I was pissed. I'm, bitch, I'm the one who's getting an award, not you. Like you shouldn't be worried about how I'm dressed. Apparently, you know, how I dress doesn't have nothing to do with what's up here. Now you can make a brand, right? So this isn't about making, a, you can make a brand statement. Matter of fact, I have rebranded myself so that it includes things like jeans. So I don't want to try and make it seem like that's not a thing, but it's, again, there's intentionality behind it, right? So I wasn't really being intentional. That's just where I was in life. And I wasn't ready to acknowledge this is where I was. So I was offended by any reaction to how I was presented. Then I started getting things like, oh, well, you're masculine. I am not masculine. But you might not know that because I show up every day and kicks in in a t-shirt every single day, all the time, right? So I had to, I didn't necessarily have to come out and make this public statement of like, hey, I'm going back to caring about how I look. But then it started to show up because it's, I started to care about how I looked. So I might wear a t-shirt, it's typically a branded t-shirt. I might throw my blazer on with it or put it with some heels or put it with some, you know, designer shoes that are supposed to go with it, not just some regular kicks. I started to create a brand look that encompassed that, but also like kicked up what I was doing. Now, if you see me, most of the time I have on some light makeup, my hair is done, my nails is done, I'll have on jewelry. Like I, over time, I have adjusted. When I stepped out into the last Black Ball Summit, I like had a whole like entourage of different outfits that I was wearing for the whole course of the, of the evening. Right. Like I ramped it back up to that space of where it felt comfortable for me. I don't have to make that announcement, but if you've known me over the last several years, you can definitively see a change in how I present myself. So sometimes it's just being 
good with who you are and right setting things, right? And so like that's not necessarily in the terms of a relationship, but it is when I've had people who, hey, I have this meeting I want to set up with you, but like, how are you going to come dressed, right? They want to make an introduction. They don't trust how I'm going to show up in that space. So how do I right set that? Not necessarily for them, maybe for them, maybe because that relationship is important and I want to keep it, but also how do I show up authentically and how I actually want to present myself? Because when you're building those networks, you do want to come as the most authentic version of you. Does that make sense? Yes, that was perfect. I appreciate that. Of course. Who else? I would just resonate. I would just say that, Jace, <laughs> that stuff, like all of it resonate. I resonate so well with it. Um, and like I, with the, with the timing thing, with the late thing, I kind of, I have taken a different approach and kind of just show up as I am. Like people expect me to be running a few minutes late type deal. Um, you know, when it comes to more of the leadership stuff, when I am showing up for my team, I've gotten a lot more intentional about um, being on time or even if I'm not on time, being the one to reach out and say, hey, give me 10 or whatever to kind of set that example. But, um, you know, our similar, I'm similar to you in like coming into this with small babies and growing up with the babies and bringing babies and being late. How important do you feel that it is to show up that authentic in that way and um yeah like just in that way I think I think authenticity and how you show up is wildly important right but also we have to recognize that we're evolving so I think the real question is how do you want to show up and then taking the steps to showing up that way. And so, so in that, it's not necessarily a right or a wrong. It is how you feel comfortable. But when you are having that pillow talk with yourself, like ask yourself, am I, am I making myself comfortable here because I'm not willing to change because I don't think I can change because it's too hard to make this change? Or am I showing up this way because this is how I want to present myself to the world. I don't think, and I'm going to use the lateness as an example, I don't think people want to be known for being late. Now, people may want to be known for being like fashionably, whatever, right? Like you may be in entertainment, you want to show up on a scene, you want to know enough people are there, um, you know, before you... Um, step on, you want to make sure, you know, the red carpet is about to be primed and ready to see you and your, you know, at your best self, right? Like just, but if that's the case, that's an intentional decision that like, hey, the party starts at 10, we're not going to show up till, you know, 11 in order to present however I want to present. You have to ask yourself, how do I want to show up? And if I'm not showing up that way, it is okay, as long as you can one, recognize it, to take accountability for it and then make the decision about when you're going to change it. Because had I tried to both show up on time and show up looking the way that I wanted to look, I probably would fail. I would probably fail at both or I'd be inconsistent. I'd be cute yeah. and late or I'd be on time and rough. Like, so there's a, <laughs> there's that process of, you know, okay, well, first I'm gonna just start showing up the way I want to, you know, present then I'm going to start really being intentional because now I know how long it takes for me to get ready. Like I know how long it takes for me to put my face together. I know how long it takes for me to pull out outfits. I've been intentional in outfit selection so that I can mix and match pieces and grab stuff pretty easily so that I don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about what it is that I'm going to wear, but I can still show up in how I, you know, um, how I want to present. Yeah. So like, 
you have to have grace for yourself in the process of self-development anywhere that you are, right? In any way that you want to be. But when you're thinking about how you build networks, understand that people are going to see you in a way. And that network, whatever different network it is, is going to relate to you in some way. The people who I was doing homeschool with, they still struggle. They know I'm a businesswoman, but like they don't really see that they're going to come to me to do business because my relationship to them was as a homeschooling mom. So so at yeah. the people who I do business with, like they struggle around what my motherhood looks like, like how, you know, I, how you show up and how people relate to you. Some of that they have to manage, but you have to ask yourself, are you presenting in the way that best defines you or who you want to become? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. Awesome. Who else? So Felicia said, great talk. Part of the buy block has been, or my block has been being consistent with networking with people who trust me more when I wear a suit, but I hate suits. Listen, so I hate suits, but, and this is just, this is just my suggestion for that. One is define what your brand looks like, right? And as long as you show up consistently and professionally in that, you'll find your tribe. But the other side of that is, like I said, I do like t-shirts. I do have children. I have literally have two small children that are right in the next room. I'm sure y'all have heard them. Like we spend time, I might sit here and be at work and then I might, might take my kids outside for a walk or take them to the park. I'm not switching my outfits every time I'm doing something. And so in that space, like I feel like I need to be comfortable and I need to show up authentic as myself. And so um, I built a board in Pinterest. Like I started looking for um, types of attire that I like so that I can start to build a consistent looking brand. So the things that I've invested in going forward are like t-shirts that I like. I have plain ones and I have ones that have a message on them. I started investing in um, what else do I wear? Blazers. I started investing in blazers so that I can match a t-shirt, jeans, and blazers with no problem. I started matching my shirts with my shoes so that I have a really easy way to be able to grab a pair of comfortable kicks. They are not, like now they're basically not Air Force Ones, right? But I have like comfortable tennis shoes. If, if you've seen some of my tennis shoes lately, like for example, I have a lot of them that are rose gold or sparkly or have something that, you know, kind of take it up a notch in the tennis shoe area. But so my feet are comfortable. They match with what I am, you know, rocking with. Right. And I've spent time like cultivating that. So I have a whole Pinterest board because when I see stuff, I add it there and I just start to, um, you know, match and match so I can get a visual for what this looks like. Okay. I said, men, men wear suits with J's now and no one is saying anything. Right. I mean, and so there is a space in where things are changing and they're becoming different and they're be, you know, and you have trendsetters who are really definitely, you know, putting stuff on the map and making it look different. I just had people talk to me about this fact that I, this is a new tattoo on my hand. I don't care. I'm grown, but I'm going to live in the way that I want to live. Right. And I can be how I want to be with no problem. When people say, why'd you get it on your, on your hand? Well, you might've didn't see, I have already on my forearms. I mean, I'm tatted up. It is what it is. So I think like in that space, be authentic with who you are, but also figure out how to be comfortable and think about where you need to sit inside your industry as you're thinking about that, right? And know that your tribe will fall, will find you as long as you're being authentic to yourself. I could still be rocking t-shirts and jeans with no nothing extra. And I would still find people who will rock with me. It's not that I won't find people who will rock with me. It's about how I want to show up. So my adjustment isn't about how they saw me if that's how I legitimately felt comfortable. The issue was I made an excuse for how I was showing up because that's where I was in that time in my life. So now that I'm not in that time in my life, I had to come back to, you actually do like this. Like I had to go back and I was looking at old pictures. Like this is who you were and this is why you made this adjustment for what, what you needed at that point in your life. That's not what you need at this point in your life. So I think when you're thinking about like how you show up to your networks and things of that sort, you can legitimately be thinking about who, who you are and allow for that voice to speak out. If it's not, if you're not showing up how you want to be, that's where you're going to have the problem. So ask yourself what, if you're making excuses, ask yourself if you're being defensive. I knew I was being defensive. Like when it hit me, it was like, 
You got a whole problem because this is not really you. This is you because this is how you are right now. This is you because you're 30 pounds too big. This is you because you're still nursing and it's hard to try and nurse in a suit. This is you because, you know, you feel some kind of way when you get up in the morning and you just don't feel like it. So I wasn't showing up authentically as me because I wasn't who I wanted to be. Awesome. All right. All right, y'all. I, well, I hope today was really helpful. I appreciate all the dialogue. And so I will just um, close out with this again. This was the last um, high performance at high noon call for 2022. I will be back on um, January the 4th. So please join me um, back then. And in the meantime, I do still have slots open. I am still enrolling people into my, excuse me, um, while I live intentionally programming course, we are up and running with that. So very excited about all that that is bringing. Um, Y'all know where to find me. Uh, very excited for what's to come in the new year. I have some new things that'll be dropping that I'll drop off at the top of the year. And um, I just want to wish everyone a happy holidays in every which way that you celebrate it. And I look forward to seeing you all in 2023. Thanks. Thanks. See ya. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year.